just love to be standing there singing and he'd walk over and look out the window. <laughs> or he'll come back and he'd sing a word or two. It didn't matter. Every time he took an ocean, he'd just yeah, sing. I'll walk right off. Yeah. <laughs> Just walk right off and look out. Just seems nothing going on. I know Mr. Earl has told him a lot of times, AP, hey, why don't you sing when you're supposed to? <laughs> he said, well, I'll get in there. Don't worry about me. <laughs> I'll be there. He'd come in on about the second or third note and sing a while, and then he'd quit, and he'll come in again. But I guess that's one thing that made people uh, take a more notice to his singing, you know, listening to it closer and everything is <laughs> what he was doing. I could, because everybody always has something to say about AP. We can yeah, have... Dole Baxter always said that's the reason. She liked to hear us sing that uh, Anchored in Love Divine, said AP really had to get up. And yeah, he has to get up and work in that <laughs> work one. In that one. <laughs> what was, a? Uh, you were telling us some of those stories he said before the songs. We were discussing on the way up here, the way that shows were put on. You know, and um, you better watch what you're saying. That thing's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Might get burned up. <laughs> no, uh, uh, you know, AP used to tell a little story. What was it before? Uh, I believe it was Wondering Boy that you used to, you know, you used to do, and he tell this little story about, and he'd almost cry every time. Yeah, but I don't remember. That. I don't remember what it was. I was telling them. I said you might remember it, but no. I didn't. Do you remember ever hearing him do it? tell little stories, you know. Tell a little story about the song, you know, and he'd almost wind up crying every time Yeah. before we had um, start the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it was Wondering Boy. Maybe yeah, you know, I, I would tell about this, something about the boy wandering away from home. Yeah, and, I don't remember telling him. <laughs> I don't remember what it, his story was. I don't either. I can't get it together. No. He really got sentimental with you. Yeah, he really did. Did you program out what you were going to do ahead of time, or just he would just think of them and then you'd? No, we'd have our programs made up. You'd work them out. How would you get the bookings from from where you were going to play? Well, he usually got out and got them himself. Yeah, he would then. go out. Mm -hmm. You remember the time, sir? He left me and you to do a show by ourselves. And we went back to Mr. Stipes that night and he was in the bed. Yeah. <laughs> was that down there? Down at the little old school. Where that uh, woman got up and introduced one and his, uh, we was going to sing Lonesome Day and she got up and she said, the next number will be Lonesome Dog. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> we laughed so. <laughs> lonesome Dog. <laughs> Who said that? Is uh, the teacher. The teacher down there that school. night. She mm -hmm. was helping us she with the show. Because oh, we had announcing. never done one by ourselves, <laughs> and we were green as gourds at, you know, doing anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, this happened. This thing happened again in Nashville. But, uh, when we first went down there, uh, somebody called it Lonesome Dog. I know I gave it to, I believe it was uh, Vito to put on the program, you know, one time. And uh, they, he had put it down on the the script, you know, and the announcer read it up on some dog. <laughs> he did his O instead of A. Uh, how would they work those shows? He would go out and find a place, uh, what, a school? or School, mostly. Then would they pay you a flat fee or a percentage? Percentage. Or? We worked on the percentage mostly when we started, didn't we? Yeah, First time. all that time. Uh, did they guarantee you so much or anything? No. And who did the publicity for the show? There wasn't very much done. We just had a few little handbills. That was about it. Did uh, Did Archie send you each one of those handbills? He sent me one. Yeah. He sent me a little handbill, sir. Oh about yeah. About this big yeah, of a theater, was yeah. Starlight Theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it didn't say where it was at, and it said the admission fifteen and twenty five yeah. cents. Yeah. He sent me one. I was curious how those things, you know, who printed those up or... Well, I don't know. That's what I didn't know. I was hoping that the town would be on there, but it well, wasn't. Well, I, I think it was in Kentucky, somewhere where he had to print it, I believe. I don't know, but he had them printed somewhere where we played this particular mm -hmm. theater. Because we did have some made out, you know, that we just filmed out. 
you where know. we were playing ourselves. Well, I believe it. But this one was printed all of it, in you Kentucky, know. Kentucky, I believe. There was some handwriting in it. In the one I was thinking of there, I think it's hard. Yeah, I think it had the the date was handwritten in and a few things like that. I didn't think to bring an extra copy because I knew he had sent them to you. Yeah, yeah, I remember he sent me one. Uh, I don't remember where that theater was at, but it was a Starlight Theater, I remember, I think. And then every time you played it, he'd pass those things out or post them up himself or... Post them himself. Usually he'd just take off side roads and everywhere and just stick them up on, you know, around or leave them in stores and places like that. Public places. Mm -hmm. how, how early would he start doing this? A few weeks ahead or that day or...? A few weeks ahead, usually. About two weeks. our friends out there again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gives you hear that peacock a holler. Yeah. Uh, I had a lot of questions that came up after listening to those transcription discs. I'd like to go through the whole history of how you moved out there and when and why and all that. Maybe you can just... Mm, what year was it? We went to 38, 1938 in October. Started work the 1st of October. 1938. Where from? From Virginia? From Macy Springs. Yeah, uh, I don't know exactly how we got the contract, but anyway, it come from through Harry O'Neill from Chicago. See, he hired us mm -hmm. and sent us out there. And uh, the first year we worked in Mexico in person, see, I mean, those six months. And we had to get passports and all that stuff, which was a lot of uh, trouble, red tape and everything. So we worked over there in person six months, and after that we just started cutting these transcriptions and sending them to the stations, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, what, you did a show every day? You do a half-hour show every day for that six months? No, we worked, after we started cutting transcriptions, we worked three hours one day a week. Mm -hmm. After the kids started with us, uh, because they were in school and we worked three hours, I think it's Thursday afternoon, wasn't it? I believe it was. And uh, we cut six 30 minute transcriptions. Before that time, the first six months, that meant that every day you had to go oh, over yeah, there. Oh, yeah, we had to go show. over there every night. We was on. Uh, we was on an hour, wasn't we? I think so. Oh, we were on in person an hour from 9 to 10 every Which night. It was a live show. A live show, yeah. What was the reason for, for moving down to Texas that way? Was, was it a steadier income or, or...? Well, in fact, it was the first, uh, first job we'd ever had, you know, on radio after we started recording. It was our first radio show, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. When we went to Del Rio in 1938, and we started recording in 26, or 27, see. So it really meant a more stable income for sure. you. It was a lot mm -hmm. better financially. Yeah, they paid yeah. us by the week, see, a mm -hmm. steady salary a week, every week. And then when the kids came in, they got their extra yeah. money. Mm -hmm. Well, then when they started making the transcriptions, you say at first these were cut someplace and then someplace else. Well, most of them we cut was in San Antonio, Texas. I mean, the ones we cut to send over, you know, after we quit going over in person. Uh, yeah, we cut quite a few there in Del Rio, you know, Don. Yeah, we cut some down in, in uh, uh, Eagle, Eagle Pass, too, you know. First you did them live, and then in Del Rio, then in Eagle Pass, then in San Antonio. That's right. And there was no difference, it was just that it was a different studio. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Change. Mm -hmm. well, uh, who was the announcer? Harry Steele, when we first started. Harry Steele. No, Uncle Bill was the first one. No, when then we, we got, started in Del Rio. Yeah, when we started. In Del Rio. Uh, Harry, he was there. Or not, so don't you remember? Harry Steele. I know we had Harry Steele and we had Uncle Bill, too. Brother Bill. Brother Bill, rather. Well, he would come in at, uh, at San Antonio. Where he, where we yeah, he people. started in San Antonio with us, that's right. Yeah, we had Harry Steele because I remember very well, you know, when we drove to Eagle Pass one day 
he decided he wanted to drive and he liked to turn to sober yeah. and I said never again. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Harry Steele? Where was he from? Chicago. Uh, was he, uh, what, was he in the record business or? In no, he there? just done the commercials, didn't he? Announcing. Announcing. He, was he worked an for the, uh, Drug mm. trade. Mm. Consolidated Drug Company in I Chicago. See. So he announced and put in the ads and everything else. Well, now on these later ones, the ones that I have, the ads aren't on the transcriptions. No, they cut them open, you know, so you could uh, put the commercials in between mm -hmm. the songs. That's the way we had done them. Mm -hmm. There, they didn't do the commercial right there. Mm -hmm. They cut so them they, separate. Didn't yeah. They? See, they put them in, or the announcer that run the transcriptions read those commercials in there. You know, I see. run them in there. Uh, those transcriptions were apparently played a lot, a fir at first, this was just broadcast over XCRA, and then when you went to uh, San Antonio, you say Brother Bill started announcing then? Uh-huh. Brother Bill, well, did we have any more announcers? Uh, Slim Reinhardt yeah. done quite, Cowboy quite Slim. a few. Mm. Slim, Cowboy Slim Reinhardt done quite a few of them with us. Who was Brother Bill? He's just a man. <laughs> He's the announcer from the station, or no? The, the uh, drug company sent him, and I don't know where his uh, where he was. I don't from. know where he was from. I never did know where he came from. They just sent him there, and he was there to do the shows with us. Was he a young fellow, or no? He's middle aged. Kind of a middle aged man. What, are, what what were the announcers' uh, reactions to the music? Well, he is Brother Bill. He'd almost <laughs> shout every time we, you know, <laughs> sing an old hymn. He really liked that. Uh, he really liked that. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't stand that. He was. I think he was a, all more or less a minister, oh. church member, you know. Mm -hmm. So he didn't work for the station at all. He worked for the, the company. for Harry Steele, mm -hmm. actually, or running for the uh, consolidated, consolidated drugs. Consolidated drugs. Yeah. I don't know whoever was running that company. Yes. Uh, Harry O'Neill. Harry O'Neill had the company. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, when was it that they started broadcasting these transcriptions on, on other stations besides uh, Del Rio? Well, it wasn't too long, was it? After we. I don't think so. In fact, I don't. I don't I know don't exactly, remember. because they would never tell us, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. And they could have been run them a long time before we even knew it or found out about it. See. Did it pay any extra money when they put them on the other stations? No. We you? got so much a week, and that was it. You got paid for working for them, and they could do whatever they yeah, wanted with them then. Yeah. What they wanted to do. Uh, now. The ones that I had, well, that you heard the other night, it sounded just like you were in, in Monterey. He announced those, and then the station breaks at XET mm -hmm. Monterey. How'd they work that? How'd they get those other station breaks on? You know, if you recorded these for each station. Well, I believe, uh, since you mentioned that, that we did, uh, that he did do the station breaks on some of them. But it's been so long, I just don't remember what stations. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, they made them for, you know, after so long time, they started cutting them for s certain stations. Mm -hmm. And they would put the station break on there. They would redub them or make a new copy, and then he would just put on a different station tail? I or imagine what? That's, uh, that's the way they did some of them, but some of them he'd done them right when we recorded them. But in any case, you didn't have to record them two or three times, no, it was huh. just once. No, they could dub them over, you know, for mm -hmm. that, if they wanted to. I wonder how many copies, how many different stations were getting these? I have no idea. Well, I don't know if that one in uh, San Diego, XELO. And there's one at Rosetta Beach. I don't know what the call letters that station was, but... That was two, I know of. Well, then they had them in uh, Eagle Pass and uh, Del Rio and Monterey, I know. Yeah. That's five then. How about, uh, were they only in the Mexican stations that they had these broadcasts? 
I think so. I think the most of them was uh, Mexican played stations. in Mexico on the Mexican stations. How's come none of the uh, stations on this side played them? I believe, though, uh, I believe I they did know. run them in Chicago. I think they had one on WJJD mm. for a while. And how about... And maybe another station or two, I don't know. Because I've heard, uh, and unless they was using the old records, they could have been using just the records. Mm -hmm. But I've had people to tell me that they've heard us, you know, there many times in the, from J WJJD in Chicago, and it had to be them or the, just the old records, mm -hmm. one or the other. Uh, how did you get, uh, for the records, you told me various ways that you got songs. How about for the transcriptions? You recorded so many more songs on transcription than wherever on record. Man, it was just songs, I guess, we didn't think of. <laughs> well, just that we just learned and had to think up some different. You know, we get tired of singing the same old thing over mm -hmm. and over. Did you play some of those tunes like Cumberland Gap on personal shows like you did on the transcriptions? Oh, once in a while, I think. Uh, and back when we were, we didn't do too, too many personals after we started. <laughs> after we started working on radio, see, the most personals we did was after, just after we, our records started selling, you know, and we worked these little old schools and sometimes uh, churches. Just around up, um, close home. Around close home in Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia. And after we started this radio thing, we hardly ever done any more. Personals. Personals, maybe just one in a great while, you know. Well, I was we went up to in Pennsylvania a few trips in those parks. Did you like doing personals? Oh yeah, I don't mind it. I, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've been doing it for about 35 years myself, and uh, of course, sir, I hadn't done near, I don't as, care much near as much of it as I have. You prefer in, the transcriptions? I'd rather have a steady job <laughs> on the stations than one. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you ever, well, rehearse or work up the songs for the, did you work them up mainly for, for the record companies or, or how was that? Well, we'd rehearse them. We'd have them timed out when we went up there to make them, you know. We'd usually get them all ready before we went and have them all timed and everything. Oh, we had to do this at And, and we hardly it. ever used a, a word in front of us, did we? Tell, so we got down right toward the last a few times we had to because uh, we just had so many up here we couldn't remember them all. I had time, you know. But we'd have them all timed and all memorized by the time we got there nearly. We never had to make them over. Not either. too many times we didn't. I guess recording a song has changed a lot since those days. Oh, it? Lord, yes. What is the differences? Can you? Well, now they they record everything on tape, you know. And if you make a mistake, all they got to do is just erase it off right quick, you know. You run it backwards or, or which way they run it. And uh, then when we started, they we record them on this big old wax. And if you ruined one of them, it took them quite a while to get it all shaved off. They had to cut it off, you know, and get it take the whole thing off, even. Mm, and start all over start again. Start all over again. And now, if you record on tape like we do now, if you get it all perfect, you know, like you want it till you get to the last line or the last uh, course or something, they can take that off and you can just cut that one part and they can splice it on there. So now you can, you, there's so many ways of doing things now. Mm -hmm. Doing it the faster way. Yeah. But yet it takes, you say it, it takes, takes a lot longer. longer. Why does it I take mean, longer? well, they're just more particular now about things, and you have to get the things more perfect now than you did then. Back then, when I'd make a mistake, I'd say, I want to do this over. They, and uh, maybe I'd persuade them to let us do it over, and then they'd come out with the one I made the mistake on. <laughs> They've done it, haven't they, sir? So a lot of times. Yeah, they'll be certain to do that. It's like 
And Mr. Pierce said, well, that makes them listen that much closer, you know. If you make a mistake, they listen for it. If they hear it, then they go listen again to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> but those old records, though, was uh, the old wax kind is the best, best material. They got that clear rain to them. Uh, <clears throat> when you left Texas, where did you go? Went back home, didn't we? Went home, and then we went to WBT in Charlotte. Charlotte, North Carolina. For six months, and that was where we wound up. Wound That's up. Where back. I wound up. <laughs> well, uh, in 43. Well, then what year was it you left Texas? We left there in uh, 41, I guess, or 40. 41, I guess. Well, we left in March of 42, I think. Because we'd start in October of one year and wind up the next year in March, see. We just worked through the winter months. Or had, was, had this spring. seemed to uh, start a pattern or something, this idea of working at radio stations? This is a new idea to you. Well, the radio, you know, was better in the winter months. It was better than it was in summer months. And that's why they run these in the winter, I reckon was because you could pick up the stations a lot better in wintertime where most people listen to radio at night more in the wintertime than they did in summertime. Mm -hmm. So therefore we just worked the six months out of the year, you know. Even when you were in Texas? Yeah. October, November, December, January, February, March. Then what would they have the rest of the year on the radio? Well, I don't know. Well, they probably run. I don't know what they did. I didn't. <laughs> and listen, they kept. They kept some of them. You know, talent. I think Lou Childer was out there for uh, two, uh, two or three years, maybe. He was there when we went there, mm -hmm. and the Pickard family was there when we went there. And but the Mayonnaire, Mayonnaire, Maynard, Maynard, Maynard Mountaineers yeah. was. Uh, and yeah, Cowboys Lee, huh? He lived there. Then. Yeah, but I'm speaking of Del Rio now. The ones was on Del Rio when we went there was the Pickard family, Lou Childry, and uh, Essie and Kay, the Prairie Sweethearts. And Rose Dawn. Yeah, Rose Dawn. You remember her? <laughs> Rose Dawn. Mm -hmm. What about, when did you write You Are My Flower? I don't remember well, what year to you. I don't remember what year, but it it was released and out before we went to Del Rio quite a while. It must have been in the early 30s. Where did you learn that tune? I put the tune to that myself. You just put the tune together? I kind of, you know, I used to love to hear the Mexican music, you know, mm -hmm. the, and uh, I just started uh, you know, kind of messing around with it and came up with that. But there was and Mexican had a, influence in there, was it? Well, that's where I got my idea from a tune, was from the Mexican music I had listened to. But these, uh, we had a whole uh, string of lyrics that we got these words out of, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And we just picked them out and put them together out of this thing, and it was Oh, the grass is just as green, I believe, was on there. What was it a poem, you mean? Poem, poetry. Poetry. Just a long, one of these, what, little books or something? No, it was just a sheet of, uh, about that long, there with verses, you know, written out of poetry. I've still got that thing, I think, somewhere at home. Really? Just written on one side? I believe I have. Oh, what did become, stuff. what went with all of them old ballads we had? I've got there? quite a few of them. I don't have a one. You know, I've got several of them that I had when I was in Texas. You, you used know. to have a lot of her programs, you know, had made off. You used yeah, to keep but I don't have any of them. I've got a lot of the old songs <coughs> we sing. Quite a few of them just wrote down on the paper. It's turned yellow. It's so old. Because I went through all of them when I was picking out material for my album, trying to find, you know, what I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. A lot of that came from print, and then you would just fix out a tune for it or something. 
Yeah, I can sing with Coal Miner's Blues. It didn't have a tune either, so mm -hmm. I yeah, think it was Prince. Well, that I remember. I don't know how, but I remember us going back up in that hill. Back there in the from that liner. Give us a lot of Prince, you know, mm -hmm. poems. Just give us poems and poetry Prince. and stuff that we uh, just come a lot up of with them these that way. songs. I mean, make her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nobody ever thought of even singing those things. No. But uh, I remember very well when we went to get Coal Miner's Blues, but I tried to tell Archie Green, you know, he was interested in him. Uh, it was back up in there above uh, St. Charles somewhere, Pennington Gap. Yeah, coal Miner. Miner. Town. Yeah, he was a coal miner. And what? I don't know uh, how we found out about it. I was trying to remember, mm -hmm. or maybe somebody told us about him having it or something, you know. And he, <clears throat> I don't know where he got it, whether he wrote them or. I, I don't know. Remember. I don't know if there's any names to it, any of them. I don't uh -uh, think I don't so. Any. I think this print, this poems, you know. Have they come out in magazines or in books or? Must have come out. Some have been paper, you know. Looked like they've been cut out of. Well, I know I used to cut paper. Mm -hmm. Cut them out of papers, you know, magazines and things like uh, this tune. Now, I don't know who wrote the the words to this. You know, this blind boy was singing it down there the night. That's no one like mother to me. And I got the words from that somewhere, and I put the tune to that one, you know, and uh, in another one I wrote that, I am so happy, what was that, da 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 Never life. Forsake You. Yeah, no, Never, never forsake. forsake That's another one of mine, and uh, uh, another one I wrote. I didn't write very many myself, but I put a few of them together, you know, or put tunes to them. And um, they never forsake you. I wrote that one in uh, Why Do You Cry, Little Darling. And Buddies that in the Saddle. That was mine. Buddies in the Saddle was mine. Where did you get the words for Buddies in the Saddle? I wrote them. <laughs> that, those you just, <laughs> that is just, <laughs> just took that from scratch, the music and everything. I just took that from scratch, and I took Why Do You Cry, Little Darling from scratch. And also mm -hmm. Lonesome Homesick Blues was mine the words and everything because I was so homesick then I could have died. I think that was the first one. That was the first song you wrote? Yeah. Uh, and then I wrote Why Do You Cry Them Darling? That's when the war broke out, you know, and they're taking them all to war. And I don't know if you've heard it or not, I guess you have. It was on the back of Lonesome Homesick Blues. That and Bill Monroe is. used to do Why Do You Cry Little Darling a lot. I heard him do it on the opera a long time ago, just after it came out. You said that you had always liked that Mexican music. Where had you heard it? Well, I'd heard it over from the, on the Mexican stations. When you were living in Virginia? Yeah. Uh, Did you write any other songs because of that? You know, because of that, during the Mexican music? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't, can't remember anything. Because I don't write too much. I write, I've had uh, quite a few tunes in later years, you know, after I started with my girls. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's one or two in our songbook that I wrote that um, don't wait. It's a hymn. And then another one that I'm one of God's children. I wrote that one. And uh, another one I put the Arthur Smith, I think, or Ruby Moody, one or the other. I bought the words from them in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I put this tune to it. It's called A Vision from Heaven. And uh, I, we never did record it or do anything with it. But uh, I bought the words off of the 
It's either Ruby Moody or Arthur Smith. I don't know which one. And um, I know I run a, or I used to do it a lot when I was on the air in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, I didn't have a title for it, you know. So I gave a, a little prize for somebody to name it for me, and that's the name I came up with, A Vision from Heaven. Uh, I can't remember any of it now, but it's a pretty song. It's a hymn. And uh, another one was I've Got a Home Up in Glory. That was my tune. I bought, the, bought those words from Arthur Q. Smith. He, he used to write a lot, you know, and he wouldn't have any tunes. So I have uh, put the, we recorded them for Columbia back, me and the girls when we first started. I've got a home up in glory and don't wait. In the early days, you recorded mainly songs that you just knew, that yeah. you had just known. Yeah. And then, I don't know when it was that you started writing songs, or, you know, one of you would start writing the songs or reworking them. I guess AP said that the first song that he ever wrote was uh, Little Darling Pal of Mine. I guess, uh, I don't know, for some reason you just needed a song and couldn't think of anything you knew or what? Well, that's, uh, you run out, you know, after a while. <laughs> after you record 350 songs, they get kind of scarce. Well, the thing that interested me was that in the early days you recorded the songs that you had known, and then, then you started writing songs, and then your very last recording session was almost all songs that you had known again, but had never recorded. Things like, uh, uh, Black Jack Davy, then the uh, uh, ship at Nef Golden Valley, oh, singing the Lonesome mm -hmm. Sea, same time, 38. Mm -hmm. Waves on the Sea. Where did the waves on the sea come from? I don't know. That's another one I don't know one for years. I but think uh, that there are Black and Beckler. Used to sing that when I was a little girl. Well, you know, Duke used to do. My bro older brother used to do a lot of his old tunes like that. And uh, um, he used to play a lot of old banjo tunes. And my mother used to play old five string banjo. Like I said, when I was playing a lot of these old tunes, I don't know what I'm playing. <laughs> I don't know what the name of them are. And this single girl, married girl, uh, uh, Roy Elam, uh, I heard that. He's from up around Lebanon, Virginia. Hmm. What was this man's name that uh, we used to go up there in, uh, and we got uh, Dixie Darling from? Harmon Jackson. Yeah, Harmon Jackson. He's the one that first one I ever heard do Dixie Darling. And Dixie Darling, my home's in old Virginia. Yeah. Don't forget the song. Don't it's forget the, title. the song. Uh, a song that interested me was uh, Don't Ever Let the Devil Get the Upper Hand of You. <laughs> I don't know where we got that. I mm -hmm. uh, either. But I think we got quite a few of those old tunes like that one in uh, uh, No Distinction and I got no, that no distinction and uh, keep on the firing line and 50 miles of elbow room. I learned it from these 78 people, ministers. Well, Greenville, uh, Greenville California. A lot, here. Mm -hmm. a lot of those too we got from these, uh, uh, you know, they have a, what they call a holiness. Yeah. Uh, Revivals. Preachers, revivals, and we got quite a few of them from them too. Like the little like black the, train. That's right. The little black I, train, I think, is where we heard that at one of the uh, churches. And uh, it was another one, a sweet heaven in my view. Did you get them from those books or from going to Just the church? Just hearing. Just from hearing them and singing them. <coughs> and uh, I think uh, that they wrote a lot of them because 
I've heard a, a lot of them, you know, that uh, have t old tunes that I have known maybe that they write these songs to these old familiar tunes, you know. That wasn't your, your own church? No. Mm -hmm. There used to be a lot of those people in our country around there, you know, right. and uh, we would go and because we never... I mean, there was nothing else for us to do or nowhere to go, you know, we just go. Go for the curiosity of it. <laughs> just go to hear them sing and, you know, just... Carry on. Just enjoy going, I did. I enjoyed going and hearing them, you know. And we'd walk for miles at home to go to the... to listen to them sing and everything. You like their Back music? Back when I was a well, kid. they did have some pretty oh, songs. Oh, yeah, they had real good and songs. Really. And did you want to say anything any more about those, how, how the later uh, recording sessions had some of the early songs that they, you know, that was, that really interests me tremendously, how those, some of the songs you've known for years did on your very last recording sessions. Well, we probably didn't think of them. Just didn't like, think of them, just like I was, like I've been all the last three <laughs> weeks trying to think of something to sing. and. You know, and maybe after I work a week, I'll think of another one, you know. <laughs> and uh, somebody will come in and request this, and I'll say, well, I forgot all about that one. And that's just the way they are. You just can't keep them all in your head. You just don't think of them, you know. Mm -hmm. and your style of picking was quite different then, too. Weren't you using a flat pick sometimes? Well, I did some. I still use flat pick a lot, but I don't use it too much. I would if I did certain songs I'd have to use it, but I just haven't been doing those songs since I've been out here, you know, mm -hmm. that I use that pick on. I haven't done any of them. When did you start using that uh, flat pick? Do you remember how you came to it? Oh, I don't know. I guess back when we when we did uh, you, you Are My Flower and uh, stuff like that that and Jealous Hearted Me, mm -hmm. and uh, quite a few of them I've done with like that. And you can probably tell more about when I've done it by looking at your list, mm -hmm. that you have, you know, you you know more about when we recorded them and, and uh, all of that than I do. I'm interested though in how you started to use that when you've been playing well, with your fingers all their time. Till I just, uh, I knew I had to get a different uh, lick because it was a faster tune and I couldn't do it with the picks. I had, uh, my brother uh, had played and he always used a flat pick, you know. I'm gonna make a whole tape on guitar style. Oh. A little bit later on. What was the role of the uh, A and R men these days? Did it change from the beginning to Let's say in '41 or '40, you know, did, were they, did they treat you any differently? Did they say we want a certain kind of song, or they just... always took anything we took up there? It didn't matter. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they ever turned one down. No, they ever did. They? No, they take everything we took, and uh, sometimes I'd say, well, this song don't make sense. It don't sound right. The words are not worded right, you know, <laughs> and everything. You say, well, that don't make no difference, and they. Just take them right on. I mean, like I was, I didn't want to sing that same old girl married girl. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Pierce said, now you didn't want to sing that. He had to insist on it. And it was the one that started mm -hmm. off, sold them off, the first three records. But the A&R men seemed never to try and push you in any direction? No. Mm -hmm. Except for that case of with uh, Jimmy Rogers. They did try and influence you there. Well, it was their idea that we do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't ever thought of it. Now, you say I one of those songs it. was your song and the other was Jimmy's. Uh -huh. The Wonderful City was Jimmy's. Mm -hmm. And on all of them, you picked guitar and he didn't do anything. And... Same. So. Yeah, but I mean... Uh... No, he didn't do it. So it was just he the two voices in your guitar in both of those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, our time is just about, on this tape, it's just about run out, and uh, I'll just get the date on. This is uh, April 24th, and we're at Angels Camp, California, and Mike Seeger and Ed Can visiting uh, Sarah and Coy Bays and Maybelle Carter.